full steam ahead. The uh, South Carolina legislature and Governor Haley are working full time, well, relatively speaking, on the agenda for this year. The legislature has, among all the ceremonial things, have gotten down to some real legislation. Uh, the, uh, they're talking about, of course, the Obamacare nullification law, uh, dealing with ethics, uh, dealing with uh, education, uh, restructuring the, uh, the panel of six House members, and uh, three House members and three Senate members got together to talk about the Department of Administration, agreed on a plan, and it is quite likely that both House and Senate will approve this new Department of Administration. And we're going to look into some of the details on another voice with Eric and friends uh, in the coming weeks. The general idea is a good one. South Carolina has uh, for years, I mean, it's traditionally been run almost by committee on the executive side, the Department of Transportation, the Budget and Control Board, where the governor, whoever that governor may be, has little control over aspects that are the executive aspects and the money, uh, how the money is spent. Uh, DOT, one of the big problems there is that the, the uh, person in charge of transportation or the governor doesn't have but just one vote on the board. Uh, so for in its traditional and South Carolina history of government, there's a lot of committee, uh, ruling by committee and boards. And so the Department of Administration would put uh, it, it in the cabinet and obviously the choice to head that would be vetted by the Senate and so forth. But in addition to that, uh, the, they're looking at uh, adding the, or taking the superintendent of education, uh, the adjutant general, and maybe a few other offices that we normally and traditionally vote on, and, and making them cabinet offices, letting the governor uh, nominate the people and letting the Senate vet them, like on the national scale where the president uh, appoints who he wants to run certain uh, agencies, cabinet agencies, and then the Senate vets them. Um, and I think that's a better way, a more efficient way to, to run a government. So that's, that, that has happened. And there's a lot of things that are really working hard and fast. Um, let's talk about one specific uh, bill. We've talked about it in the past. Uh, the House passed it last year, and the Senate today passed it uh, with a, a, a large margin, sending it back to the House to, for final approval, and that's the uh, restaurant carry law. I think it may be called something different, but basically, current law says that, that a, you are not allowed to take a firearm, even with a CWP, into an establishment that sells alcohol, uh, open, uh, for consumption, for example, a restaurant or a bar. And this law would make it legal for concealed weapon permit holders to carry their firearms with them uh, into a restaurant that serves alcohol, alcohol or even a bar. Um, we've talked about this before. I've expressed the fact that I understand the, the, the impetus behind this. And I'll give you an example. I can go into McDonald's carrying my, say, my, my firearm in my pocket with my concealed weapon permit. Uh, the other day, my mom and I went out for dinner, and right next to the McDonald's where I could do that is the Ruby Tuesdays where she uh, wanted to go. I could not carry my, my pistol into this, the Ruby Tuesdays because they serve alcohol. I don't drink alcohol, never have. But I wasn't allowed to because the law says that it's a business that sells alcohol. There are many people who are CWB holders who think, why? I'm not a drinker. I'm not going to drink. It's not anything about drinking. I'm going to a restaurant. Why can I not carry my CWP, uh, carry my pistol? Uh, and that's kind of the, the impetus behind this bill. Well, the bill is laid out so that you could carry it in that situation, but you could also carry it into Joe's pub down the street. Um, I have expressed that I understand I don't have a problem with with allowing a CWP holder to carry a firearm into a restaurant, a business that gets the majority of their income from food, as long as they don't drink. Because I don't think alcohol and firearms mix well at all. But I don't approve of, I disagree with taking it into a bar. Now, I know there are a lot of folks out there who are going to say, oh, it's fine, it's fine. That's fine. I, yes, there are people who go to a bar who aren't going to drink. They go to for a concert. Uh, they uh, are going to be the designated driver. But the majority of people, the vast, overwhelming majority of people, the reason they're going into the bar is to drink. I don't think we should be inviting that. But 
it looks like this law is going to pass. Uh, I would be surprised if this was not the law of the land in a few months. But it was interesting, I was watching the news report about this, and I looked at it from a different perspective that made me wonder. There was a, a local uh, bar that served food, uh, owner, who said, you know, I believe people have the right to, to defend themselves. I fully support people have the right to carry firearms. I just don't think it should be in a bar. And I wouldn't want them to carry a firearm into my bar. Um, but she said, you know, the question I had was, and this is what it got me on, the law will allow a bar or a restaurant to post a sign saying no CWP. And that stops it right there. What uh, Senator Bright, Lee Bright, gentleman running to replace Lindsey Graham, one of the sponsors, one of the main sponsors behind this bill, said was, you know, businesses have that right, and people have the right not to, to patronize their business. And a lot of people won't patronize businesses that say, you can't bring a firearm in here. I understand that. That's your right to do that. But it did bring an ins interesting um, dilemma up, because what that woman, owner of a bar, said was, you know, I personally don't want firearms in a bar, in my bar, but I, I can't afford to lose business over this. So I reluctantly would allow it to happen because I have to make, you know, a successful business. Now, for many who are watching this, who are saying, that's my right to carry the gun in there. I have the right to do that. You're absolutely right. You do. But I wonder, and you have the right to say, if you say that you can't bring, I can't bring my gun in there, I'm not going to go to your business. And you have every right to do that. But I'm wondering about the give and take between fellow Americans. A business owner who doesn't feel comfortable with a firearm in an alcoholic, an alcohol establishment. Feeling pressured by economics, by money, to do what she does not feel comfortable doing. Because you or I insist that I have to have my firearm with me everywhere I want to go. Is there a little bit of give? For me, I carry my firearm, you know, where, you know, around town. Um, and I follow the rules where if I have a go into a restaurant or a business, not a restaurant, but a business that says no firearms, I'd leave my firearm in the truck. I don't boycott that business. Because the owner of a private business establishment has said, I don't really want that in here. I wonder if maybe we should have a little more common ground here. Maybe a little more, yes, I have the right to do this, but I'm going to respect your right to not do this. I'm not saying you have to. I completely understand. But I wonder if we should think about that. I still re reiterate my opinion. That guns and alcohol don't mix. And I would prefer that the bill simply allowed firearms to be carried into businesses that get the majority of their income from food, which could be classified as restaurants, with the caveat that you can't drink while having the firearm, but not into a bar. I know, you're going to argue and disagree with me, that's fine. Put them in the comments, I want to hear what you have to say. Um, but that's... That's something that's coming up. And if you have an opinion on this, if you think, yes, it should happen, we should be able to, call your representatives, write your senators, say, yes, I want this to go. Make sure you send a letter to the Governor Haley and say, yeah, I want it. If you disagree, if you don't like it, do the same thing. Tell them what you want. Because, look, no matter what these gentlemen and ladies think, no matter what their personal idea is, they want to be reelected. And they're there actually to represent you. So let them know what you want. Uh, on, on our future shows, we'll be talking, well, actually this coming Monday, we're going to be talking about Governor Haley's agenda, her uh, budgetary priorities, and what she's wanting to do. Uh, we'll talk a little bit, I'm sure, about what legislation has come through, what's being passed, what's on the docket. And in future shows, we're going to address individual uh, specific pieces of legislation or ideas that are happening. Uh, but I just wanted to give you, you know, they're down there working. It's good to see it. I love it, getting down there and getting some work done. Not agreeing with everything, but uh, it is important that you pay attention. 
I'm trying to find a way because I could post the link to all the actual bills, but they're lo they're lawyer ease, they're legal ease, and it's it, you have to read and it's hard. And I, who's trying to give you information, get tired of reading them. So I'm trying to find a way to be able to 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 give you information so that you can make good decisions about it without giving a spin either way. And hopefully that will be coming up on our our website, can I get a word in dot com, or and or on our Facebook, um, <coughs> another voice with Eric and friends. All right, make sure you you make some comments down here in the comment sections and our on our Facebook page on our uh, YouTube channel, be another voice, or or tweet to us at Twitter, uh, at be another voice. Until we talk again, get out in your community and make a difference.